I think most of us would agree that early life experiences have a tremendous impact on how we feel, how we think, how we love, and how we live for the rest of our lives. One of my favorite TED Talks, um, Brian Stevenson, opens with a story that when he was nine years old, his grandma took him aside and told him, amongst other things, never ever to drink alcohol. He was nine, so he said yes. <laughs> but when he's telling this story, aged 52, he confesses to the crowd for the first time, he says, I've never had a single drop of alcohol in my entire life because of that promise I made to my grandma. Another really good example comes from a study done by Harry Harlow. In 1950, treatment and education of children was led by psychologists such as B.F. Skinner, who believed that infant-mother attachment formed purely as a function of the mother providing biological needs to the infant. Now, Harry Harlow actually was in disagreement with this, and he wanted to prove that there was much more to attachment than just having food provided for. So he took infant rhesus monkeys from their natural mothers and raised them with surrogate mothers. There were typically two surrogate mothers. One was a cloth mother that was simply covered with a cloth. Another one was a wire mother that actually gave milk and nourishment. When these monkeys had both mothers available to them, they would spend the majority of the time with the actual cloth mother, but then sometimes visit the wire mother just to feed. Now, they had to choose between one of the mothers. When faced with this, this, this decision, the infant monkeys chose the cloth mother and clung onto the cloth mother to the point of starvation. There are two amazing things about this study. One is that this was the first scientific demonstration that attachment, or as Harlow put it, love, was much more than just having biological needs provided for. It was a paradigm shift at the time where People thought that if you touched and hugged your children, you'll raise them to be spoilt and selfish, and they will not form a part of the society. If TED existed back then, I think Harlow would have definitely been invited to give a talk instead of me telling you about this story. <laughs> but the second amazing thing is that these surrogate reared monkeys, compared to naturally reared monkeys, when they were introduced to each other or to other monkeys, could not form social attachment to the other monkeys, regardless of which surrogate mother they were raised with. They could not socialize, they could not connect, and they could not interact with other monkeys like the naturally reared ones did. This shows that early life experiences can really change you forever. And most of all, these monkeys grew up to be very, very anxious compared to their natural mothers. I think onset of anxiety disorders around the world, the age, actually tells us that, yes, early life experiences can be so pervasive. Anxiety disorders are characterized by feelings of fear and anxiety and panic that prevent you from doing things that you can do at everyday basis. For example, going to work, um, seeing a movie, finding relationships and love. It includes social anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorders, as well as phobias. Now, the median age of onset for anxiety disorders is 10 years of age. This is the median age, not the average, but the median. So if all of us are currently clinically diagnosed with an anxiety disorder right now, which is totally possible in this audience, I reckon, <laughs> <laughs> 50% of us would have been diagnosed by the age of 10. And the earliest 25% are diagnosed by the age of 5. I always thought these stats were actually a bit hard to believe. But I was at a fundraising event last year, and one of 
our donors, a gentleman, came to me and said, hmm, you're a neuroscientist. Tell me what you do. And I said, I study fear. And he said, oh, that's so cool, you study beer. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I study fear. <laughs> Specifically, I study early treatment of early onset anxiety disorders. And I said, whether you believe it or not, anxiety disorders start very early, and the earliest ones are the most severe. And they usually start from childhood. And he looked me in my eyes, and he actually said, I believe you. I believe you completely, because my six-year-old son has recently been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. And looking back, it's true, I have an early experience that sort of makes me anxious now, too. So I was 11 years old um, when I moved to Australia from Korea, where I was born. Um, and one of the biggest differences I observed in primary school education when I moved to Australia was that compared to South Korea, they really um, valued athletic and sporting abilities really early in life. It determined your popularity, it determined your friends, it even determined how much teachers liked you. And that was really not the case in South Korea. I was good at math and that's all I needed. Um, everybody liked me. <laughs> but um, so, you know, I was this scrawny Asian girl with no motor, motor coordination whatsoever, no reflexes. Um, trying to play t-ball for the first time. I've never even heard of t-ball. But I was actually pretty confident that I can hit this ball that was motionless, you know, stationary, adjusted to my height, kindly. So I thought I could hit it, and my peers were pretty patient when I, even when I had three strikes and accosted us and out. But it was the fielding that was a real problem. I have major trouble following a moving object with my eyes. So if you were to throw me a ball right now, I'll be like, where did it go? I'd be like, oh, or, oh, ah! So I could not feel for, like, to save my life, and my peers were really mad at me, and I was this new girl, it made me very anxious, but that was still okay. The worst part was my teacher setting me aside, saying, gee, I don't want you to play with the other kids during playtime anymore. I want you to practice catching a ball for the rest of this term by yourself. So for the rest of the term, my first term in Australia, um, everybody will be playing cricket or t-ball or softball, and I'll be at the side just... <laughs> just wishing that playtime will be over. I'm 31 now, and I still have pathological fear of all forms of organized sports. <laughs> <laughs> so Freud was the first to theorize that anxiety disorders may begin from early life memories that are quite bad. Now, John Watson, father of behaviorism, took this idea further. What he did was get, acquire somehow an 11-month-old little orphan, and he called him Little Albert. John Watson wanted to show that you could create an anxious baby by exposing the baby to a traumatic event. He wanted to show this by using Pavlovian conditioning principles. Now, Pavlovian conditioning is very simple. It's basically learning by association. So usually something can be quite neutral and then you, have an, you develop an emotional feelings towards it. So for example, I have pretty fond feelings about passive smoking. I know it sounds weird, but it's because my favorite cousin who I love so much and who makes me so happy, she's a chain smoker. And when she's happy, she smokes a lot. But when she sees me, she's really happy. So she's always smoking when she's with me. So for me, passive smoking, happiness. <laughs> passive smoking, happiness. So now, whenever I see someone smoke and I smell it, I get filled with these warm and fuzzy feelings, and that person <laughs> immediately becomes very attractive to me. And <laughs> so that's what Pavlovian conditioning is. 
that's positive conditioning, um, but poor little Albert had aversive conditioning. So basically, in the first phase, they um, gave a rat to little Albert, to which he played with, and he showed signs of delight and you know, pleasure in interacting with the rat. And then they took the rat away. They represented the rat, and when Albert touched the rat, they sounded that really loud gong behind his head, ding, to which Albert cried and reached out for the caregiver. He obviously was very averse to this very loud noise behind his head. They did that repeatedly, rat noise, rat noise, rat noise, to the point that when rat came out by itself without any noise, Albert just started crying and started avoiding the rat. If this study was possible now, <laughs> Albert would have received some type of exposure therapy to treat this condition. Exposure therapies form the backbone of most effective cognitive behavioural therapies that exist for anxiety disorders today. So as the name implies, exposure therapy is actually quite simple. You simply expose the patient to the fear-inducing stimuli and let the patient learn all over again that, you know, it's not bad, it's not the end of the world, and desensitize that fear. So it can be real, real objects, um, like, for example, if I'm a socially anxious person, I can come here and really expose myself to that fear and realize that you guys won't be throwing eggs at me or anything like that and get over that fear. Or it can be actually virtual. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it can be virtual, like in this example. So this person is um, pathologically afraid of cockroaches, so can't really touch anything and definitely can't live in Australia. Um, he thinks that, you know, through this virtual therapy, there are cockroaches crawling all over his hand, but deep down knows that there isn't. So he can expose himself to this fear and realise that it's not so bad. Or it can even be imagined. So in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder, you obviously can't return the patient um, to that horrific incident again, um, not with ethics approval anyway. But... <laughs> So the person is asked to imagine going back and think about all the elements and realise that, no, now I'm safe, I'm OK. So if exposure therapies are so effective, why is it that the prevalence of anxiety disorder still remains very high? On average, it's 20 to 30% around the world, the lifetime prevalence. That means that one in three of us can develop an anxiety disorder at least once in our lifetime. This is because we know that exposure therapies, it's not erasing the original fear memory, it's creating a new memory that, you know, in certain environments, like in the clinic with your clinician, maybe with your family, that things are OK. But as soon as the patient is alone, rem is removed from the clinic, or is stressed out, the fear can come right back. So what we do know is that exposure therapies create a second memory that is not as strong as the first fear memory. Now, my colleagues and I in Australia and others have around the world shown that if exposure therapy occurs early, then fear can be gone forever, for good. It's only when exposure therapy happens late that it's so fragile. What that tells me is that children are actually more robust, more robust than adults, to change the experience of trauma into something good or at least something that's not so aversive and so crippling. But why is it that anxiety disorder still emerge so early and so prevalent? In Australia, there's one counsellor available for every 1,600 students ranging from preschool to secondary school. One for every 1,600. Can you imagine being the 1,600th child in line to talk to someone when you've been bullied today, when you've been ostracised today, 
and you want to kill yourself. The situation is the same in the US, one in 1600. The best stats in, um, in that domain is displayed by Israel, one in every 650. But in other parts of the world, it gets really, really worse. In the UK, one in 3,000. In China, one in 9,000. In Nigeria, one counsellor available for every 90,000 students. And where I was born, South Korea, one for 184,000 students. Now, these counsellors aren't necessarily masters of clinical psychology and all those qualified. These counsellors were simply teachers who identified themselves as having a counselling role in a preschool, primary school, secondary school environment. When I was a child, I made up my mind that no one loved me. That life may not be worth it, and that love maybe was a conditional transaction between people. When I grew up, when I became, I think, 16, I actually learned that I was wrong. You know, children can think wrong things about the world, about life, about love, but I promise that children don't think that way without good reasons. I had my reasons too. But fortunately, I learned that wasn't the case, that people do love me, that my life was worth living. But I feel like that second learning occurred later rather than earlier, because I know when I'm stressed out, when I'm hurt, when I feel betrayed, or when I think I've really screwed up something or hurt someone, I relapse back into being that little child who thinks that there's no love in this world. I think I needed somebody to talk to when I was five. I think there is a little Albert in our children now, in me, and definitely in you. I think we should give little Albert someone to talk to early in life rather than later in life. I want you to join me in making that a reality. Thank you.